Welcome, Mr. Candidate, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, ceremony in which, which I now open and in which uh, Carlos Morillo Escura will defend the academic thesis entitled Unraveling the Underlying Mechanism, Mechanisms Behind Chronic Spinal Pain and Their Response to Treatment with Special Focus on Chronic Whiplash-Associated Disorders. Mr. Morillo, uh, before we go uh, to the defense of your thesis, I would like to invite you to present the major uh, conclusions of your thesis in a brief presentation of about 15 minutes. Please, floor, floor is yours. Uh, dear Prorector, dear committee members, dear promoters, uh, dear colleagues, uh, friends and family, uh, I'm going to introduce my investigation these last four years. Chronic spinal pain is a very prevalent disorder. For example, low back pain is the first leading cause of disability uh, with a prevalence of 9.4%. Neck pain is not far behind with a 4.9%. There is a specific type of neck pain that is uh, neck pain after trauma, after whiplash, for example, after a car accident. So to give it a bit of context, uh, 20 to 45% of the people who have a car accident will suffer from this condition and after six months half of them will develop chronic pain so if you think it through that's the same probability than tossing a coin for decades the cornerstone of the treatment of people with chronic spinal pain in general and chronic whiplash in, in particular has been physiotherapy more specifically exercise however there is still a very low response rate so how could we know what is going wrong? Okay, the approach that we took in this investigation is unraveling the underlying mechanisms of chronic pain in these conditions and the response to treatment. So normally uh, we are interested on the effect of an intervention of a treatment on an outcome, for example, disability. But sometimes it's more interesting to look behind to look how the interventions work. And for that, uh, we have a specific type of statistical analysis that is called mediation. This analysis allows you to disentangle the effect of the intervention into the indirect effect that flows through uh, intermediate variables. So if these intermediate variables are changing, and if this leads to changes in the outcome, in disability. Another way to, to know about the mechanisms for pain is uh, through neuroimaging techniques. So uh, studying the brain function and structure, and for example, examine if in a, in a person with chronic pain, the brain differs with, uh, with pain-free controls. Or for example, to test how the, the brain in, in, in a person with pain responds to treatment. So in this dissertation, we in the first part, we focus in generally in chronic spinal pain, and we use mediation analysis. And in a second part, we go specific to chronic whiplash associated disorders, and we will use neuroimaging techniques. In both parts, through the entire investigation, we focus specifically on a particular type of new or, uh, or novel treatment that is pain neuroscience education combined with exercise. So what are the underlying mechanisms behind the effects of pain neuroscience education combined with exercise in patients with chronic spinal pain? Disability, uh, a lot of evidence actually have support that disability is affected by negative cognitions and behaviors like pain catastrophizing, pain related fear, and it's believed that the effect of the treatment gets reduced because of these factors. So in the last decades, uh, psychological st strategies were integrated in the management of people with chronic pain because it was hypothesized that by specifically targeting these factors, the, the treatment was going to improve. So what we did in the first step was synthesizing the available evidence on mediation analysis in uh, psychologically based interventions for chronic pain. We were able to retrieve 28 uh, mediation analyses and we found that uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, a particular case of uh, psychological therapy, uh, the effects of this intervention on disability were mediated via reductions in pain catastrophizing, pain-related fear, and increases in self-efficacy. We found also some support for acceptance commitment uh, therapy, 
uh, and we found that indeed the effects on disability of this particular intervention were mediated through increases in pain acceptance and increases in psychological flexibility. So these are very exciting results because indeed we are finding some support for the theoretical models, but however, how certain can we be about these results? Unfortunately, unfortunately, very little because of high risk of bias. So quickly, what are bias? So if you think uh, about politics, uh, like media bias, you know, like uh, a specific piece of information can be completely different depending on the media source that you go to. So in research, it's the same. Uh, for example, co-funding bias. So normally, when we estimate the effect of an intervention on disability, this effect can be affected by external factors. For example, the intervention can have a different effect in women and men, or like depending on the severity level of the disease. That's why a random control, a random control trial is, is that important, because it's able to cancel out uh, these, these effects. So a random control trial could be like uh, in the vaccination for COVID. Some people get the vaccine, some people get the placebo. This is random, and they don't know what they're getting. However, in mediation analysis, we are working with third variables, and there are this uh, random control trial is unable to cancel out all the possible co-funding in all possible relationships. So many of the results that we've seen might not be completely true because not all the studies or many did not account for this possibility, among other problems. So what we did in a second step, we identified the possible pitfalls, so we tried to address them in our trial with pain neuroscience education combined with exercise. We wanted to see how the effect of the treatment at, uh, the on disability at six months uh, follow-up was mediated. So our candidate mediators were pain catastrophizing, pain intensity, pain relative fear, and ce uh, central sensation related distress all measure a post-intervention, and we also include the post-intervention value of uh, the outcome, disability. So here we see the diagram, we see that here we have our intervention, our mediators that we are specifically target, uh, targeting during the intervention, and the outcome. So what we also corrected for these problems that we just mentioned, the co-founders, so then were cancelled out, and then we found that the effect of the intervention on disability, six month follow up, the end of the intervention was mediated by reductions in pain relative fear and distress. And these reductions happen even beyond when you, we took out the improvement in disability at post intervention. So to make it a bit more clear, we have, of course, is as expected, the effect of the intervention six month follow up is going to be highly or strongly mediated by how it, the outcome changes just post-intervention. However, this is not all. All the changes need to be need to be done, like in, in the ones that we just mentioned, for uh, achieve or retain the, the treatment effects. Importantly, we also find, or we also found, sorry, that uh, these changes do not happen in an independent manner. So they this, these colors that we see, these elements, they are combining, they are interacting with each other. So then in a second part, we now go to Wiplas in particular, and we are going to use neuroimaging to uh, focus in. So we know that in the transition from acute to chronic pain, the brain shifts uh, from somatosensory areas to cognitive uh, and affective areas. Uh, normally, how pain has been studied in neuroimaging research is in two ways. First, uh, inducing experimental pain. For example, someone with no pain, go to the scanner, you apply some stimuli, a painful stimuli, and then examine the brain. How responds to that stimuli? Another way, that, that way was highly criticized to not be very reflective of what it is chronic pain. So then another way was investigating clinical pain. So a patient with pain, go into the scanner, and then you examine the brain with his or her ongoing pain. However, this type of paradigms or experiments are not a true reflection of disability and the associated factors to disability. So disability is, for example, uh, that you cannot perform an activity that you want because of your pain. There is some novel evidence that showed that the mere imagination of the problematic movement can induce fear and pain that are actually equal to the actual performance of the movement. So this is suggested to be because of a memory representation of fear in the brain. So using this, uh, this evidence as support, some studies have used pictorial uh, paradigms 
to investigate the neural correlates of disability in people with chronic low back pain. However, there was up to date no evidence in people with chronic whiplash. So we addressed this knowledge gap in our research. So we took our chronic whiplash patients and we saw them uh, neck specific movements and neutral movements and we compare them and then we compare these responses with uh, pain-free controls and we found several things first that people with chronic whiplash have greater activation in neck specific movements in somatosensory areas this could be because they predict the consequences the sensory consequence consequences of the of the movement that they were observing and importantly, this activation was somatotopically located, so it was in the, soma in the area of the somatosensory cortex associated with the neck and the arm. All the things that we found, other impaired activation, were located in attentional areas. Uh, this, of course, remains speculative, but some explanations could be that people with chronic whiplash have greater attentional monitoring of the movements, uh, greater emotional evaluation and cognitive demands when they observe or they plan to, to do the movement. These findings were in line with what we found or what was found before in other research. Another way to investigate the brain is to examine the structure of the brain, the structure of more specifically the gray matter. So previous, there's many studies in people with chronic low back pain that actually they found that the people with pain have less gray matter in areas within the cognitive pain modulation uh, system. So we again took our chronic whiplash patients and compared them against pain-free controls, and we find similar results. For example, a decrease of gray matter in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And importantly, these decreases were correlated with hypervigilance in people with pain. For example, those patients with higher hypervigilance of pain have lower gray matter in all of these three areas. As a final step, we wanted to see how these abnormalities responded to treatment, to pain and exercise and physiotherapy, and we found that only one of them have an increase over time after therapy, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right side, and importantly, these changes were not observed in pain-free controls during the same time. And these changes also were not specific to interventions, so were observed in both interventions. Uh, some reasons could be that there were no differences between interventions in disability, so they were quite equal, none of them were superior to the other, and why just one of these was reversed was maybe because the, at the end the response rate of the therapy was quite low, 44%. So one option, explanation, speculative of course, this could reflect placebo analgesia, treatment expectations if we look at the function of, of this particular region in the brain. And in addition, we found uh, other subtle changes in the brain, some related to nociceptive areas, so decrease of gray matter in these areas, also increase of gray matter in some emotionally related uh, areas. So the conclusions, the, the home messages, the home messages of this uh, investigation. Uh, thanks to neuroimaging, we were able to know that people with chronic whiplash have uh, might predict their pain when conceptualizing uh, the specific movements, and these, because of this, they might adopt uh, dysfunctional behavioral responses, and when hypervigilant, uh, they might have an impaired pain modulation. Okay. Pain neuroscience education combined with exercise is an effective treatment uh, for people with chronic spinal pain, uh, and those effectiveness might be mediated uh, via reductions in relative fear and centralization related stress, as we saw in our mediation analysis. In chronic whiplash, uh, still not very effective, and its effects are similar to the ones that we obtain with physiotherapy. Still, both interventions can induce some gray matter changes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moridio, for this uh, complete overview and the conclusions of your thesis. Um, we will now start the opposition in defense of your thesis. Your supervisors have chosen a number of experts in the field, uh, experts that cover different areas of the field, uh, which have assessed the quality of your thesis. And uh, these assessors will now uh, pose some remaining questions uh, about your uh, thesis during the opposition. 
Um, the opposition will be uh, opened by Professor Duby. Professor Duby is Professor of Epidemiology and Physiotherapy at the University of uh, Maastricht. Please, Professor Duby. Thank you, Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, uh, congratulations with a well-written and elaborate thesis that tries to unravel the underlying mechanisms behind chronic spinal pain and whiplus patients specifically. Um, this has been undoubtedly been an, uh, an interesting and intensive journey, and I want not only to congratulate you, but also your team of supervisors who guided you in this undertaking. Um, as you might have guessed, doing a double degree is quite a lot of work, and uh, in your case, double the trouble, and from an administrative point, quadruple the trouble, but we won't go in details on about that. Today, you have arrived at your uh, final defense, so after we have grilled you for 45 minutes, there's a high chance that you will be able to conclude this with a doctoral degree, and we will have drinks afterwards. But before that, I have some questions, and other people will have them of course, too. I'm impressed with your thorough analysis of the problem, um, but I'm still a bit unsure whether your proposed approach works in uh, chronic whiplash patients, as you already said yourself. Your findings and idea are partially based on the secondary analysis of the trial from uh, Galal and uh, Martin, uh, but their patients are chronic spinal pain patients. So my first question would be, of course, is a chronic whiplash patient a chronic spinal pain patient? So what's your idea? Because you gave some clues already. Yeah, uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, that's a really good question. So the idea of this- I is thought so too, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so the idea of this investigation is we clearly highlight uh, chronic whiplash associated disorders as a specific type of chronic spinal pain. Mm -hmm. So that's where, where we try to always uh, do a contraposition with low back pain. Mm -hmm. These patients have lower uh, recovery rates, greater uh, chronification rates. So we know that something is, is going on and it, it can be clearly seen why, for example, pain in science education is quite effective in people with chronic low back pain. But we just saw in this super study that might not be the case for for chronic whiplash. Of course, the, the, the final results of the larger trial is still, still ongoing, so it's not final, but the, it seems that it's not the same. So indeed, there are several factors like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, perceived injustice, uh, greater central sensitization that might be uh, making this, this a bigger problem with these patients. And, uh, I understand that, and I, in the old days, I used to be a physical therapist. And I've seen quite a number of these patients, and one of the things that struck me is that they had fear of movement, yep. and sometimes even, uh, in the end, fear for the fear itself. Mm -hmm. um, now, you have a program that has to do with uh, psychoneuroeducation and exercise. Um, if you have patients that already are afraid to move, why do you still give them exercise therapy instead of not only a cognitive program in which they imagine that they are moving. So do we need the exercise component? I know I'm now making myself unpopular among a whole range of uh, physiotherapists, but do we need the exercise still? Because we know that imagining things, uh, you know, the people who go from a ski slope, they imagine that they're going down or on a bobsled. So could not only the imagining be enough? Yeah. Uh yeah, indeed, uh, there are, for example, motor imaginary therapy that has been using, uh, has been using complex, uh, well, in, in other disorders. Uh, I'm not aware that that type of intervention has been ever tested in people with chronic whiplash. I no, it's not, but you're the never. expert, right? So. Yeah, uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah, the approach that I take in my dissertations is I'm giving an intervention, uh, mm -hmm. and then I try to apply statistical methods and try to see how it works. Uh, at the end of the day, it is what we know with evidence is that at the moment there is no intervention that is better than other. What we know as well that compared to chronic low back pain, chronic whiplash have received very little attention. There is only four trials of psychologically informed physiotherapy. There is no trial, this one, is still not out on pain and science education. And all of them, they are pointing to the same direction that we are doing things wrong. That there is no superiority mm -hmm. with a standard care or a standard physiotherapy. And could it, could it not be that, that we are too late? 
we first wait for patients to become chronic, yeah. and then yeah, yeah. we, uh, well, we get everything we can from a therapeutic armamentarium to get them going. So even half the patients with uh, whiplash, they become chronic, right? So shouldn't we be before, so someone sustained a whiplash, and shouldn't we immediately start with uh, fear reduction and fear of movement and stuff like that? What would be your opinion? Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, and I think that's what uh, the group in, of uh, the group of Mitchell Australia in Australia are working on. So indeed, the good thing or the advantage of whiplash is that you know when the pain starts, so you are able to identify the problem quite quickly. So there are some um, uh, pathway analysis that actually show which I saw it a bit who which patients based on their baseline characteristics might develop chronic pain at three months already. So maybe three months, subacute stage could be the perfect moment uh, to start with more, uh, with more es uh, special, es es specific uh, interventions for these patients. Indeed, in the acute stage, there is very, very few research. I know that there are some systematic reviews on that mm -hmm. doing in University of Birmingham, uh, and I think they actually don't f didn't find like a difference. Uh, between interventions. So maybe three months, the subacute is, is the right opportunity. Uh, there are some studies, but yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and uh, if, you if you look at the uh, uh, short question, because uh, then yep. the others can uh, go as well. Um, the changes in the brain, they don't happen overnight, right? They take some time. Uh, let's say six weeks to three months. So could you imagine preventing these changes happening that if you have a whiplash patient, you see them the next day and not wait for three months? Yeah, I mean, there is some, some evidence that show that changes in the brain can happen even after one hour. I need everything in pain-free control, so this had to, you know, how you generalize those findings to people with pain has to be done extremely careful. Uh, and I agree with you that that can take a while. So indeed, uh, you could try to prevent that happening. It's still, causal effects here also take it very, very careful. You don't know if the pain causes the brain or the brain causes the pain uh, to change. So maybe that you try to prevent this change in the brain and because of that, you are uh, reducing pain. So that's a very interesting hypothesis is to, to test. I would like to do it in the near future if possible. So uh, yeah, indeed trying to, to look how the brain reacts to early interventions and if that prevents or mediates pain, that could be extremely important, I think. Okay. I'm happy with your answers, and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you, uh, Professor De Bee. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Ba Biggs. Um, Dr. Biggs is a specialist in pain neuroimaging at the Stanford University in the USA. Dr. Biggs. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, I'd also like to start by congratulating you and your whole team on this thesis. Um, you've conducted clearly a lot of research um, in this time, and I have a couple of questions for you about it. Um, I'd like to start focusing in on chapters three and four, your imaging work that you did there, um, and especially the analyses that you conducted. Um, for both chapters, you adopted mostly the ANOVA approach, um, and I'm curious because, for instance, in chapter three, you do have from all your participants at the end um, fear ratings for the images that they saw. And you show in the figure that um, they are indeed, on average, more afraid um, of the high fear pictures versus the moderate and the neutral, but there's a high degree of spread. So I'm curious, do you think that instead of adopting the ANOVA approach, there could have been a way to incorporate um, this data and perhaps improve the sensitivity of the test that was conducted? And if so, how would you go about doing this? Uh, okay, dear esteemed opponent, thank you, thank you very much for your question. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, it's a, a very, very good question. So indeed, we use uh, ANOVA. Uh, we look into the fixed mm. factors and the interactions. Uh, there are different ways, as you suggested. For example, a trial-by-trial -trial approach where is normally used when in, in the experimental pain studies where you are providing pain, then you ask for the rating just afterwards, and then you are able to, to correlate in a better way the, the stimuli and the rating. Uh, we did opt for our approach where we actually saw many pictures 
continuously because in that way we were gaining a lot of power. So this was the first study in chronic whiplash. So we wanted to really prioritize that. Uh, we also were kind of afraid, of afraid, based on previous piloting that we did or other studies that one of my promoters did of uh, head motion. So we really wanted to reduce noise as much as possible, increase power to be able to provide the first exploratory, exploratory, exploratory results. What we are doing now, actually, and is in line with what you suggested, is fitting a, a mediation analysis cross-sectional one, so multilevel uh, mediation analysis. Mm -hmm. And did, uh, what we are doing to try to reduce this kind of noise of variability that you, you clearly saw because of different ratings in pictures, is just instead of grouping the pictures by category like high fear, moderate, and neutral, we are going picture by picture, so grouping just picture one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. So in that way, we, we are able to decrease that, that variability and get it a, a, a more a better relationship between the rating that we have at the end of a scanner and the brain measure that we have in the scanner. Yeah. Then, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what I'm wondering is then if you're concerned or you want to maximize the power you have availability, what is the benefit of the moderate fear picture? Why not just do high versus neutral? That's a really good question as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, indeed, that was hours and hours of discussion in the piloting and the planning of the study. Uh, I always try to come from a statistical point of view, so much power, much better. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were other, uh, of course, uh, theories and uh, other insights that could be gained using the moderate pictures. Because at the end of the day, we artificially created the categories. We, of course, based on validated data uh, in, in, in WIPLAS uh, patients. But I agree with you. Uh, maybe having, uh, at the end, we just testing interactions. It's true that we corrected for them, like the Bonferroni corrections for the contrast. I think, uh, yeah, we could not, yeah, indeed, we could have, OK, we remove the, the moderate pictures, then we have more repetitions of each. Yeah, that's true. That could have been. We thought that it could be interesting with the moderate. In terms of the mediation analysis, we are going to strip out this thing of the categories, and we go for different pictures. So the moderate pictures are quite interesting, because they are not uh, lifting a weight. Mm -hmm. So they are like net movements. So I think that, indeed, they provided quite insightful information. But then when you compare with the other, yeah, the other are really high fear. And of course, they they uh, produce a, a great response. Yeah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I think I have time for a super speedy question still at the end. Um, sticking in that theme of the pain-related fear, uh, for chapter three, you start off by um, saying that the, the similar paradigms have been done with chronic low back pain, but not with the whiplash. And I'm curious, d do you then conceptualize that, that the pain-related fear that an individual with back pain has when they look at a back movement is in some way qualitatively different than from the pain-related fear that a whiplash patient might have when they look at a neck movement? Um, or why else would you expect those correlates to be different? With one minute to go. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, indeed, uh, it, it was in line with, with previous questions. Uh, yeah, we try to always create this contraposition. Mm -hmm. I, I tried, of course, in this presentation, there was not enough time to cover it, but uh, yeah, there are some things, as I mentioned, that some particularities of chronic whiplash that might make this relationship different. They have some evidence that indeed, uh, for example, pain, uh, post traumatic stress influence the relationship between pain and fear, uh, pain and disability, fear and disability. How do you know that there is an influence? You, do, you cannot infer how, because this is all many times cross-sectional research, observational research, a lot of bias. Uh, so it, it is hard to say. It seems that it is a bit different, the relationship between pain, disability, and fear. But it's still unclear, very unclear, what's the difference, I think. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. I return the words. Thank you, Dr. Biggs. Opposition will be continued by uh, Professor De Pau. Uh, Dr. De Pau is assistant professor uh, at Ghent University, and his uh, expertise is in epidemiology and pain neuroimaging. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prorector. Um, dear candidate, 
Um, also from my side, my congratulations for the work that is currently uh, lying here and also to the team of supervisors. I think you did a, a very nice job in um, publishing in very high impact journals as well with your work, so really congratulations for that. But I also have some questions for you, of course, and as you might have guessed, they are a bit in the direction of statistics and uh, epidemiology. Um, my first question is actually, um, I had a feeling in your thesis that mediators and moderators, you don't really do anything uh, or a lot of attention on moderators, but they are separated, right? So you focus on mediation in, in many of your papers. You also talked already that um, many of the current um, published articles that are out there, they don't find many great effects, right? That was a discussion before. Um, why didn't you consider applying a model that would combine both uh, mediators and moderators? Because that might give maybe more insight to whom we might expect to experience better or greater effects compared to others. Or maybe there are some considerations to be made why not to apply these kinds of models. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Uh, again, very, very insightful. Indeed, uh, I think the biggest problem with this type of research is that we are always doing it in, as a secondary analysis. So that's the biggest problem. For example, there is some simulation studies showing that you need 16 times bigger sample size to calculate or estimate a FM modification than for a normal average treatment effect, 16 times more. So when you take one sample or one data set that has been, as you know, that the sample has been calculated for, for average treatment effect, and you try to fit these models, it's not going to work. Uh, you have very, very little, pro, uh, little power. There is two new and very good uh, independent uh, data, independent participant data meta-analysis in osteoarthrosis and low back pain when they are looking at uh, this thing of moderators combining all the data, they still, again, are quite limited in the number or in, in the type of, of moderators that they are, they are looking at, because indeed they are taking all the data, but that's a good first step. Uh, why, uh, so at the end, we did not test the moderation in, in, our, in our analysis because of the same reason, and at the end there were like more parameters almost than, than observations, so yeah. Uh, indeed, there are some, uh, as you suggested, the combination could be like a moderated mediation analysis. Uh, the, the way to combine our interventional effects models could be heterogeneous intervention, uh, interventional effects models that have been also recently suggested. Uh, that could be a way, but completely uh, unrealistic to fit with our data. Hopefully, in future analysis, future studies could, could really answer that question. Thank you for your answer. Um, what I'm thinking of here as well is, so you're talking about um, that you need an additional sample size, which is 16 times bigger yeah. than the original one. But of course, power of your analysis also depends on the size, the effect size that you detect. Yeah. So if you think that a moderation analysis would, might detect higher effect size, wouldn't that it still make sense to try it out or, or not? Yeah. They there will be some who argue that indeed, uh, if you have a very great effect, uh, you would be able to detect it even with a small sample size in terms of moderation. Then you also get the problem of uncertainty, like your, uh, your confidence interval. So you are going to be missing things. It's going to be very uncertain. I think that indeed uh, I will refer to one commentary from Mikkel Hernan from Harvard, that indeed once we have data, it's always good to try it out and do exploratory things. But I also think that that's great, but with some precaution, because you cannot take any data that you have or any sample size and start trying things. Because at the end, literature gets full of things that people really do not understand, in a sense like people who are reading that work do not really see these limitations. And it happened already with my meta-analysis that I saw, like, somehow decided, and I was like, no, it, this is very preliminary evidence. It's not like, like the Bible, <laughs> I'll say that way. So, yeah, indeed, I agree with you, but always with caution and with okay. some limits. I have, uh, I think, still time for an additional question. Um, so maybe building a bit further on this, um, one of the keystones in your uh, PhD um, dissertation is about causal inference and the causal framework, right? Um, and you told already about confounding and the danger of confounding. And I think one of the 
key assumptions in causal inferences, no unmeasured confounding. Um, but yeah, from the epidemiological point of view, there is a lot of attention going to lifestyle factors. And as far as I understood, they are not really considered in your thesis at the moment. Um, was there a particular reason why not really focusing on different lifestyle factors in your thesis? Um, and should it be interesting in future research to implement lifestyle factors because now the results might still be biased? Uh, so right. could you repeat like which factors I couldn't hear? Lifestyle factors. Yeah, lifestyle. So okay. Physical, ex uh, physical activity level, health literacy, um, yeah. education. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So maybe in parts. Indeed, the health literacy is a good one, especially with pioneer science education. There has been some research trying to see if there are differences in response, the, you know, depending on the on the educational level, health literacy of, of the participants, and they have shown some results. So actually, it could be very interesting to, to show. Again, it was a secondary analysis. I could not integrate that. About lifestyle factors, indeed, uh, we could have like uh, it's just not that. This can be like trimming induced co-funding. Uh, if you think about a patient who is doing, they, they go, they get the therapy, but then outside, they go to the gym, they do exercise, they run. That is all parallel interventions at the end. So they are co-funding their own effect and this trimming induced co-funding and is affecting the relationship between the mediator and the outcome. So I think that that's been, again, uh, I get back to Harvard, to the Causal Inference Group. They are actually doing some models for that to try to integrate that information. But yeah, I think we are very, very far from there because what you propose that is great is the perfect uh, model almost. And yeah, I, I think that maybe causal, uh, causal material learning could help in feature, feature selection on there and just take like a bunch of, of like a, a small group of, of, of co-founders. Co so maybe that could reduce it, but hard, I think. Okay, thank you. I give back the word to the, uh, Mr. Corrector. Thank you, Dr. De Pau. The opposition will be continued by Professor Joosten. Professor Joosten is a professor of experimental anesthesiology and pain management at this university. Thank Professor you. Joosten. I would like to congratulate you with a very nice thesis. I would like to congratulate the team with, uh, with this uh, beautiful work. I'm here to discuss the work. So uh, already on page nine, I faced a sentence and I quote, as a result, biopsychosocial models have gradually replaced biomedical perspectives. I'm working on biomedical perspectives and uh, so that struck me as and from then I was a little bit biased. And I said, okay, uh, is it really only biopsychosocial models in the future and uh, my work uh, less important, becoming less important. Anyway, I think we want to understand the mechanisms. And, uh, and the mechanisms related to rehabilitation or to chemical interventions might be similar. And, um, and from that perspective, I read your thesis. And, and, and so I think so, Sko, what let's see what we now know. And um, on page 17, you start and say, okay, there is, uh, when pain becomes chronic, there is a shift. There's a shift from neuronal activation, which is increasingly then associated with the cognitive affective and motivational networks. That's correct, I think. And, uh, and then uh, the results, and then you did experiments, and, and the results are, are very nicely summarized, I think, in figures two on page 153 and figure three on page 156. It's a very nice summary. Nevertheless, uh, I then went back to the introduction and, and, and there you refer to a paper which I think is a very good paper in Nature Neuroscience, uh, reference number 202, Baliki et al., uh, who showed that there was a very important, uh, during chronification of pain, there is a very important connection, the nucleus accumbens to the PFC. That's where, where, where they focus on. And that's, uh, that's a key in, uh, a pathway involved in the transition of, to chronic pain. Then I go back to your figures. I don't see any effect in the nucleus accumbens. So, uh, so I was a bit confused and I say, okay, is, 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 is this whiplash completely different from low back pain? It's a bit referring to uh, what was raised uh, before me or, uh, yeah, are, did you miss something that could also be possible? 
So could you comment and, and instruct me a little bit more about these findings? And, and yeah, yeah. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, yeah, thank you uh, very much for your, your question. Indeed, uh, I want to make the comment on, on what you said, indeed, how in, the, in, the, in that paragraph that is said that the biopsychosocial models have replaced the biomedical. I also see it, and many times I criticize that people do not do biopsychosocial while they are saying so. They are actually doing a psychosocial model. So bio have the bio in it, biopsychosocial. So I don't have it as replacement, it's complemented because of biomedical, biopsychosocial is the way that I see it. And I think it's the right way, uh, or, or at least that's what evidence shows, that it has to be a complementation of, of multiple factors. Uh, in terms of the paper from Baliki that you mentioned, that indeed is the transition from, from acute to chronic uh, low back pain, and they are indeed uh, they are showing different results to ours. So, yeah, we actually took like a kind of exploratory approach in our analysis. We normal, normally, uh, yeah, we maybe were to focus on the cortex, although we run some region of interest to go to subcortical areas, and indeed we did not include that. We inform our decision making on subcortical areas based on previous similar evidence, so same paradigms. At some point, we were having maybe even too many regions of interest uh, for even correction. So uh, I think like, uh, well, the other day in the internal defense, also one question was arise that even depending on the sequence that you have, might be some distortions that might affect more to subcritical areas. So indeed we did not have like a specific uh, sequence uh, for detecting those or preventing from, from those distortions. It was a standardized sequence, so that might be a reason. Uh, other reason, of course, is pure statistics that we have such a big clusters. Uh, so this how it works with the random field theory. You always your T statistics is going, is going to be highly influenced by those big clusters that you have. That you might have something in such a small area, like the one that you just mentioned, that you just missing. There is actually now recently after publishing this paper, there has been a new approach that has been proposed that is highlight, uh, highlighted method where you actually saw like in an opa opaque mode, you saw the findings after cluster correction, but you still saw in all unthresholding findings. So maybe in the unthresholding findings, we could have found uh, something in the nucleus accumbens. We don't know. So that's a pro an approach that in the future I might use. It's more informative. Yeah, but you, it, in, it was stated in the introduction there, you, you, you use this reference, and uh, so that's why I, I yeah. read the reference, and I think, yeah. okay, and then you did decide not to include it, so that's a bit, uh, it yeah, struck me a little bit. Yeah, it's different, they were actually using resting state, so not task-based fMRI, so indeed I use it as just as a way to show that, okay, there is a change, as if in a way, rather than very informative to my own hypothesis making, uh, but yeah, so we really base our hypothesis in, in previous similar research and task based fMRI rather than resting state. Okay. Um, now, one step additional, and ad additional step, an additional step. So, so, we want to understand what is happening in these areas, not your nu nucleus accumbens, but in the prefrontal cortex and the other areas you showed to be affected. So, and then uh, you sometimes talk about activation, you talk about deactivation, and uh, as I'm uh, doing research on sensitization and the molecular aspects of sensitization as well as habituation, my question is what is, uh, what is in your opinion happening in, in, in these areas? Sometimes uh, it, it, it mingles a, a little bit, well. so there's sensitization, central sensitization, in a particular area, could you, could you link that to particular areas or uh, say, okay, an, an habituation, uh, the effect is, is related to another area which we are uh, uh, observing to be involved in, um, in, uh, in, this, in, in the treatment. Could you, could you give, help me? Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, there has been some studies trying to unravel or like try to look into the brain this phenomenon of central sensitization. Normally, there are more studies provoking pain or uh, ongoing clinical pain. Uh, indeed, I don't think our paradigm is, an a is able to really look into the central sensitization related uh, correlates in the brain because we have a uh, 
distressing, you know, pictures distressing paradigm. So I couldn't say that uh, could somehow our findings be related to, to central sensitization. It could be that the, the activation that we find in the somatosensory cortex that is higher in people with chronic pain somehow could be influenced for higher sensitization, but we could not really create that or draw that conclusion from our findings on our hypothesis or our paradigm. So it, it could be true. And at the end, what we measure in at the end is, is the ball response. So how the, the flow, the, the blood flow changes. So it is very hard. I completely, I know that there are some research that try to uh, mix the micro with this uh, fMRI activation. But it, again, we are talking about fMRI is highly noisy. All these things are always take it with a pinch of salt. Like it's very hard to infer. Okay, yes, I think the central sensitization process, which is a fundamental process in the, in, in the central nervous system, might happen. And, uh, and there, the rehabilitation and, and the medical research might, might, might come together uh, to, to tackle the molecular aspects of the central sensitization, either pharmacologically or by uh, treatments as you propose. And uh, that would be, in my opinion, part of the future. I'll give the word back to the pro -rector. Thank you, uh, Professor Joosten. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Laurier. Uh, Dr. Laurier is assistant professor uh, at Ghent University, and her field of expertise is health psychology. Floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidates, I want to congratulate you as well from my part with your solid and comprehensive work and also your uh, supervisory team, also my uh, congrats. Um, I have a few questions uh, I'd like to discuss with you. And I think you can imagine, uh, we didn't have the time before to discuss in more depth, but uh, I have a, a question concerning the non-specific uh, factors, non-specific mediators. <laughs> um, it's uh, linked to your uh, second empirical chapter on the underlying causal pathways of the PNE plus exercise intervention. Um, you found, if I recall well, that post-intervention reductions in pain-related fear and central sensitization-related distress um, seem to mediate six-month follow-up uh, improvements uh, beyond the post-intervention changes in the outcome. That's what you state. Uh, but in the general discussion, you say, well, um, there can be a potential risk of confirmatory uh, bias since non-specific mediators are often not included in, uh, in studies. And then you reflect on the need uh, for future studies to include a minimum uh, set of uh, non-specific uh, mediators. And my first question is, uh, what would this minimum set of non-specific mediators look like, based on your knowledge? Uh, and why do you propose the things that you will suggest now? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, highly esteemed opponent. Uh, yeah, indeed, there's a, a critic that I throw in my thesis, and I think maybe should be take uh, you know more seriously because normally it's what you say confirmatory bias we want to test what we think is happening but we never test what uh, we don't think is happening so at the end what we find is that uh, what is happening is what we thought that it was happening so indeed uh, for the minimum set i think therapeutic alliance it could be the the one that would be the minimum minimum there's already a meta-analysis in clinical psychology review about the mediating role in psychological interventions i think might be for depression i think not sure but yeah there is there is a role for therapeutic alliance i think that one could be the minimum there are others uh, indeed assuming that you already took all possible parallel interventions that at the end they are non-specific because yeah like that the patient is taking more uh, or more medication going to the gym uh, these things have an influence i could say that one sure i'm probably um, self-efficacy although many times is thought to not be uh, that to be a specific that's something that many treatments target but at the end all just being engaged in an intervention 
is, is going to change self-efficacy. So I think that one is a second one that I would say. So these two should be, should be important, I think. Okay, so you propose to, uh, yeah, therapeutic alliance and uh, self-efficacy while you mention it also as a specific uh, mediator also in your work, the, the last one. Self-efficacy. Uh, mm, we did in the psychological in the first chapter in the meta-analysis we include as a as a, a specific mediator. I may have another thought now, like maybe it's more non-specific or it is specific. Non -spe it depends how the look that you want to do uh, at the end. Pain catastrophizing, for example, many of these interventions they think or they 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 propose that they are specifically targeting, but you also have a lot of evidence in meta-analysis from exercise interventions that they do not uh, target uh, specifically pain catastrophizing, uh, still reduce pain catastrophizing. So this thing of the label of a specific and non-specific, uh, we use it in the in the review as a matter of what they believe is happening or like a model base rather than properly a specific, non-specific thing, like only this intervention, not this one. Because indeed in chapter one, and I think you made a comment on this in the internal defense, uh, there is a lack of evidence contrasting, for example, a sentence and commitment therapy and a CBT, they have similar or different mechanisms. There is no evidence. So at the end, they always test what they want to test and never test the shared mechanisms. And um, let's talk a little bit more about therapeutic uh, alliance, uh, for instance. If you want to include this one in, uh, in future studies, um, I think that's a, that's a challenge, no? Because I do a lot of research also on communication and the, the clinician-patient uh, interaction. And when we think of mechanisms, a lot of mechanism, mechanisms may be involved, like you based on the theor uh, theoretical model that you use, there can be specific mechanisms, like the language that you use, when you use the language, but also relational mechanisms, um, like openness, um, the respect that you have as a clinician. So that's a, that's a bit my second uh, question. That's a methodological, methodological challenge, you know, to include all these elements also as well, besides the specific mediators in, in the studies. But possibly you have some solutions. I'm afraid I'm not. <laughs> but can you, uh, can you yeah. briefly? Can you briefly? Answer yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say like one would be the working alliance in inventory. That could be one. But indeed, uh, yeah, there are many things. And that question, it doesn't capture that. Uh, there is no one answer solution i think so yeah unfortunately not okay i give the word back to the director thank you dr laurier um, opposition will be continued and finalized by uh, professor wolf professor wolf is uh, his expertise is in anesthesiology and pain medicine and he is a professor at the Univ uh, university medical center in groningen professor wolf go ahead Thank you, Director. And uh, as last opponent, my, at first, my congratulations for you and your surprising team with the very nice work. And just go directly to my first question. Um, unraveling the underlying mechanisms behind chronic spinal pain and the response to treatment with a special focus on chronic whiplash associated disorders. I am, have some, some questions about uh, the group of chronic whiplash associated disorders. What is it exactly? Is it a definition? Is it a diagnosis? Is it a di description? What is it exactly? Yeah. Thank you, highly esteemed opponent, for the question. Indeed, this a description. <laughs> associated disorders, I mentioned in the introduction, are covering a range of different symptoms and signs, uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, some central sensation related uh, uh, symptoms, uh, headache, diseases. So it's a description also used as a label many times in research to try to just target this specific population. I couldn't say that it's a diagnosis because indeed you could infer a, a pain mechanism based diagnosis to try to see what's the underlying pain mechanism, uh, nociplastic, ne neuropathic, uh, nociceptive. So this enough of diagnostics is sometimes kind, kind of hard to really reduce more like a mixture from, from my point of view. 
but uh, yeah. yeah so actually it's a group a population with a large variety and it's important for the inclusion if you're going to study patients with this disorder and there's a lot of variety so i'm also curious about the, the, the well the facts that we really can find would it have been made dif a difference if we also had included back patients or stomach patients or patients with pain on the chest because it's also pain and what is the specificity of uh, um, of the whiplash associated with disorders uh, in, re in relation to these groups what is, the, what is the real difference you mean in comparison with low back pain uh, all other sorts of disorders with chronic pain yeah, I think the the traumatic concept of the of the pain that could be, I mean, at the end you can have low back pain while first you know first low back pain while you're bending, but a car accident is a very traumatic event uh, from a point of uh, stress point of view. Uh, so I think that could be a, a one difference. The compensation, insurance, all these factors are gonna have. Uh, how the 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 the, the cost, the healthcare costs are covered because there is uh, dependencies in other persons, so it's not the same and of other uh, other disorders. And I've been working as physiotherapist for four years, and I can tell you that when you go and you're treating a chronic whiplash patient, always the accident was never their fault. Well, I'm so, nothing because many other patients also have stress. Many patients have working problems and have also compensation problems. And the only thing is that they all got the accident, but they have chronic pain and there are many other disorders with chronic pain. So I'm still doubting about the differences and, the, and the, what it, uh, how it can be compared. So would it have been also made a difference for your MRI imaging uh, that you included uh, low back pain patients? Yeah, uh, indeed, that could be an option. Uh, come back again to the presence of sample size. MRI is expensive, and indeed, uh, that could be wasn't our hypothesis or our research question. Uh, could be future research. Could be really, really interesting to do in that line, where you are taking people with chronic low back pain and a chronic whiplash, and then you see if there is a difference just using as chronic low back pain as a reference of a chronic pain disorder, and then pain free controls, and then you can compare the three groups. It wasn't our hypothesis, but still very valid and very interesting hypothesis that could actually provide some new insights into the differences and the uniqueness of chronic whiplash. So I think that research is definitely needed. Maybe I could cite it, some re research in this line that has been done in our own department. Instead of chronic low back pain, they include chronic and non-specific neck pain. So the problem that they found at the end is a bit what I was saying, uh, that the sample size was not big enough to be able to disentangle this small difference that there will be. So at the end, yeah, that could be like uh, very interesting if there are the funds available. Yeah, it should yeah be tested. I agree because the, the sample size is quite small yeah. and the, the, the other studies also describe quite small samples. And so it's each time the same problem that uh, clinical signif uh, statistical significance is low, of, is, is not there. And it's very difficult to find the differences. So we need large cohorts, I think, and to compare, compare with them. And we need the big studies. And therefore, we maybe also, in addition to the um, to your moderation and uh, mediation analysis, the artificial intelligence and um, uh, machine learning. Um, because well, how, how are we going to do this? Because uh, the uh, the point is that there's a lot of variation in patients, it's complex, and also the way of analysis is complex, so this is all or very difficult to find the, the well, what we are looking for. How are we going to do this in future? Like integrating uh, machine learning, you mean? Uh, yeah, this, how, do, how, how are we going to get the better insights? Yeah, indeed, uh, this is at the end a problem, I think, like a bigger layer problem of collaborate, you know, like more researchers collaborating with each other uh, because you really need, as you said, very huge, large sample sizes to calculate this. Even using machine learning for feature selection would help a lot because you are reducing the number of parameters that you are introducing in the model. 
but still uh, not uh, come back to my answer of the 16 times bigger sample size. Yeah, I think the independent data meta-analysis might be a way to go. Uh, observational data with a lot of participants where they can able to fit uh, in best priority weighting can be... Okay, can, can be a, another, another way to go and yeah, <laughs> don't remember, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murillo. The time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. Uh, the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and uh, the quality of your defense. And I request you and your company to await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off the mileage,
years can't fly by now, don't waste all your time, cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile.
Mr. Carlos Murillo Escura. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Smates is uh, authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confirm upon you, Carlos Murillo Escura, the degree of doctor and grant all, you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. First of all, thank you for chairing this session, Prorector. Um, thanks to the jury members for being part of the exam committee and providing such constructive feedback to the dissertation. Also, thanks to the complete supervising team for the complimentary inputs and to guarantee the successful, successful completion of the uh, PhD of Carlos. Carlos, as you know yourself, but maybe not the audience, you were born in 1991 in Zaragoza and studied your master in manual physiotherapy in Zaragoza. After three years of clinical practice, you moved from Zaragoza to Birmingham to follow a research master in spinal pain at the very new Center of Precision Rehabilitation for Spinal Pain at the University of Birmingham, identified as a world leading. When you were finishing your master in research within the topic of neuromuscular adaptation to chronic low back pain under the supervision of Professor Deborah Falla, you contacted me to apply together for a PhD fellowship in the area of musculoskeletal physiotherapy and chronic pain and its underlying mechanisms based on your background as physiotherapist and prior clinical experiences. After discussing the possibilities with Barbara, my dear colleague with whom collaborating is always a pleasure, we decided the topic of the project to be on central sensitization in chronic headache supervised by the both of us. The proposal was well appreciated, but unfortunately not granted. But luckily at the same time, Barbara and I started collaborating with Inge and Iris, resulting in a common project application on the neurocognitive approach to explain and predict response to the modern neuroscience approach for treating patients with plus associated disorders. When this project was granted, we were convinced that you, Carlos, were the ideal candidate for this project. As a result, we hired you for this position, and the PhD project evolved over time to a joint PhD with the University of Maastricht, allowing us to have another great colleague with scientific, great scientific and clinical input, Rob, as additional supervisor on board. So from the start, this has really been a joint effort between the universities. Uh, and my focus of the supervision, together with Iris, was online, actually, was on the MRI part of the project. And you were really invaluable in all the facets, from study design, protocol, collecting, of course, all the data, later on, the analyses. And I have to stress, that's pretty admirable, given that when we hired you, a physiotherapist, on an MRI-heavy project, you did not have any experience with MRI yet. 
uh, or even the brain for that matter. So Carlos, I looked up the motivation letter and the CV from back in December 2018, and you described yourself as hardworking, dedicated with a passion for research. I think that was clear today. Um, you listed some skills with MATLAB, EMG, but the word brain was not mentioned yet. <laughs> And I suppose you convinced us of your eagerness to learn, and we took a leap, uh, and today we stand here, you successfully defended your thesis, and I'm so proud of, of uh, what you accomplished. Uh, it has taken a lot out of you, and especially our first MRI paper, <laughs> which was pretty com complicated as well. I think it cost you quite some blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, and there was a time that Iris, you and I actually met almost weekly to discuss about the project. And we adapted our approach a bunch of times, of course. We wanted to align with, the, with all the state-of-the-art yeah, uh, methods. And that has been frustrated for you, frustrating. Uh, and for those of you who don't really know Carlos, he's not good at hiding that. <laughs> so that he made that pretty clear. But you showed perseverance, uh, commitment, and really a lot of growth. Uh, so after each meeting, especially when it had some time to sink in, uh, you came back eager to dive into the script, the pipeline, what have you, um, into some pretty deep rabbit holes, I think, from time to time. And uh, it was worth it. So the hard work and dedication led you to publish that paper in the respectable journal, Pain, uh, to take on the VBM project very smoothly. Uh, and to work with Marina and other neuroscientists, keeping up with them, even impressing them. Um, yeah, while well, already planning and starting the next analyses, which are even more complicated. And we should not forget, it also landed you the position in Yunia Shar's lab in the US, Denver, as an actual neuroscientist. So I'm very proud of you, and I cannot wait to see what the future holds for you. I would like to end by telling some stories how we get to know you during the past four years, formally but also informally. I think everyone agrees that you are an excellent researcher with high ambitions and expectations. You are a very hardworking person, but sometimes I had to act as your academic mother. I hope you will remember my mum's advice in the future. Please clean your desk. <laughs> but also, Try to forget the past and look ahead. You don't only have a competitive mind when it concerns your PhD, but also when doing other things. I think the latest example is your eager to win the ping pong tournament at our department. You admire dogs, you hate rain and love to play board games. Food and drinks are your hobbies. You quickly learned that Belgian beers, Belgian beers are most of the time stronger than what you were used to drink. <laughs> you eat at the oddest times. You often go to the gym first, then come to work, have breakfast around 10 or 11 a.m., and lunch somewhere between 4 and 5. So after four years, you still haven't switched to the Belgian eating rhythm and stick to the Spanish time. There is one ambition you didn't fulfill, to speak Dutch. So, and after four years of doing a PhD with Maastricht, it seems that the CH sound is still very difficult. Maastricht? <laughs> Carlos, it was an honor to have you in our team. We wish you all good luck for your postdoc position in the MRI lab in the US, and we will definitely keep in touch. And to end in Spanish, and especially for his parents who are here, <clears throat> su trabajo duro se refleja bien en ti, en su familia. Puedes estar muy orgulloso de él. Thank you. Dear Dr. Murillo, it is um, my honor uh, to congratulate you with the uh, uh, doctor title that you have acquired uh, on behalf of the Maastricht University and the Board of, of Deans of our university. You have now two degrees, one in Ghent and one in Maastricht. Um, I saw in your thesis that you love Ghent and you're leaving now to, for Denver, but I'm sure that when you would have come a little bit more to Maastricht, you would also have loved <laughs> Maastricht. Also, uh, it's cuisine, I understand. 
Um, um, I would like to congratulate also the, your supervisory team from Maastricht and from uh, Ghent. I would like to, I cannot do that in Spanish, but I would like to congratulate your parents. You did a very good job, great, uh, great thesis, great defense. Uh, you can be proud of, uh, of uh, uh, Carlos. Um, but also I would like to, of course, the, the family and friends, uh, will, uh, but also would like to congratulate uh, all that have participated in the work. Uh, science is, is not a lonely job, you do that together with others. And also those that have, been, have contributed to your thesis and the publications that have come out of your thesis, I would like to congratulate you. And finally, um, I saw that you have a very international let's say, way of life. Uh, you worked with, uh, of course, Maastricht and Ghent, but also with, uh, you, you went to England for, uh, for yeah, your studies. Yeah. You worked together with uh, uh, British universities, but also US universities. And now you're leaving for Denver, Colorado, I understand. Um, I would like to wish you a lot of success in your new career uh, as a neuroscientist, I understand. Good luck. Before I end this um, uh, meeting, um, I would like to, I have two, uh, two announcements actually, one for the committee here. We would like to make a picture with the, uh, with the new doctor and the, the paronyms together with the committee at the stairs here in front of the, of the, not in front of the building, but inside the building. And I would like to uh, ask the audience to wait for us at the elevators, just uh, until we are ready, and then to follow us to the rafter for the reception. And thereby, I close this ceremony.